All right, so Habakkuk had heard in chapter one, the people of Israel were going to be judged for their wickedness by this enemy nation, this Babylonian nation that was going to wipe them out here in the kingdom of Judah. But he knows God is righteous and that somehow God has to preserve them, that they wouldn't die. And But he just couldn't believe that God was going to consider this justice, just as God told him, you won't believe what I'm going to tell you. So that takes us to chapter two, verse one. And this is a really, really cool verse. He says, so Habakkuk responds to what God has told him. He's like, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. What an interesting answer. What does it mean to be on a tower? To me, the vision comes of Gandalf being on top of Sauron's tower all by himself. That means I'm going to sit. I want to know the answer to this hopeless situation where my people are going to be destroyed by this evil, wicked nation. He knew that God was going to spare him, but he couldn't understand how. How is God going to spare us? Look what happened to our sister nation of the kingdom of Israel. What is the kingdom of Judah going to do? So he's like, I am going to stay put until I hear what God has to say. A lot can be said about what's necessary to hear the voice of God. You ever think about that? I mean, Habakkuk, he was determined, I'm not moving till I hear the voice of God. I'm going to set myself apart where there's no distractions. I'm going to the top of the tower. Leave me alone. I'm not moving till I hear what he has to say. He put his cell phone on quiet hours, right? He turned off Messenger, uninstalled Facebook said, I'm not going to get on social media. He actually unplugged the router, so there's no Wi-Fi at all. He sat himself down, said, I'm going to listen to what God has to say. He doesn't say it here, but maybe he fasted. Maybe he meditated. We don't know if he waited hours, days, weeks. We don't know. But he said, I am not moving till I know what God wants from me. Do you follow this pattern when you want to know what God wants from you? Do we take, do we get away from all the distractions? Do we say, God What do you want from me? Or do we say, God, here's what I want to do. Help me pick between A or B, right? That's often what we do. Yeah, we say, God bless it, right? Yeah, and we say, okay, God, I screwed this up. Can you fix this? How are you going to fix this? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing. We decide we need a new car and we narrow it down to the cars we like. And then we say, God, which car? Well, do you know if God even wants you to have a new car or even a car? Or do you even know if he wants you to go to that job tomorrow? You don't know that. Sometimes there is abrupt changes in our lives. We don't like it necessarily. But if we really want to stop and listen to what God has to tell us, sometimes we have to stop and listen to what God has to tell us. Right. And again, fasting and praying certainly has a lot to do it. Meditating has a lot to do it. But we also notice we like to put a time limit on God. God, tell me by said date so I know what to do. God, I need to have the answer by this time. How about God, let your will be done. How did Jesus teach us to pray? Thy will be done. First line, right? Our God who art in heaven, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So again, don't be foolish to put God on your schedule. Commit your needs to him, commit your concerns, your hesitations, all the problems you have, and then simply wait. Wait for his direction. It can come from the Bible. It can come from other Christians. It can come from just a revelation. All of a sudden, you know what you're supposed to do. But at the end of the day, wait on God. I don't believe in all eternity anyone will ever say, man, I really regret waiting on God. I really regret having listened to his counsel. I don't think anyone will ever. I'm actually, I'm sure no one will ever say that. Don't assume that you've wasted time if you're waiting on God. He's working on you. Habakkuk waited on God. And it's really amazing to see the transformation in Habakkuk by the time you get to the end of this book. This book is all about faith. Faith is something that we all need. And faith is never wasted. We trust in God. We got to trust in him completely. So um, he sat watch. He sat down and waited. And then all of a sudden, At some point, again, we don't know how soon or how late it was. Verse two, the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, 
but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So God's going to give Habakkuk the answer. He's like, I'm going to tell you the answer, but write it down because it is going to happen. It may not happen right away, but don't worry. You'll see it. It's going to happen. And it'll happen to the letter. So again, this is the good news about all the prophecies of God. We don't have to worry as to whether they will happen or not. You don't have to worry about whether Jesus will reign on the earth. A lot of people haven't seen it yet, so they explain it away. No, no, he's not really going to do that. No, the Bible says it, it's going to happen. That's the promise Jesus gives us. That's the promise God gives us, that we can trust in his word. We don't have to worry. We just have to figure, understand how it's going to happen. A lot of times that's in hindsight. And we got to trust in the fact that it will happen. His prophecies will come to pass. He knows the end from the beginning. You can trust in his word for your past, for your present, for your future. Nothing happening in America or in any other nation in the world today is a surprise to God nothing surprises him so god's gonna reveal something profound to habakkuk and he says write it down now this is something that's interesting to me a lot of people come to bible studies they come and they don't write anything down they don't make a notation they don't jot it in their bible they listen they appreciate it they like it but does it really is it really stored for later my memory sucks maybe you have a photographic memory my memory is not that good if i don't write it down i will forget it when I watch my own Bible studies later, I'm like, wow, that is cool. You know, I mean, really, like, I, that's how my memory works. Um, but you need to digest the things you read. You need to digest the things you study. There is no reason you shouldn't have come here this evening, not having already read Habakkuk. And there's no reason you should leave here this evening without planning to read Habakkuk in the next few days to go through the things we've talked about and to make sure you understand what the word of God has to say. Again, we should learn something every time the word of God is opened and somebody is speaking on it, it should be changing something in you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, God gave you that, those, that verse, those two verses, oh God, 25, 30 years ago. And I wrote it down. I mean, he revealed some things to me. From 30 years ago. About. One of them was I was going to read Mary. Someday. And he, he goes on to say it's going to tarry, mm -hmm. but it's not going to tarry because it's going to happen exactly when, and this is, I waited about 25 or 30 years. Were you disappointed? No, no, no. 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 Okay, Wayne, you did good. No, wait, I just wondered, you know, you don't realize what God's doing in the interim, right? Yes, and he's preparing, he's preparing you and preparing the answer, right, yeah. to your prayer. Yeah. So again, this brings up a very important principle. As before, wait on God. Wait on him. Sometimes it's just wait. Stop trying to rush things. Patience is a, he is a virtue. Literally, patience is a virtue. That is a true statement, right? God is working and just focus on him. When you look around and you don't see him working, that doesn't mean he's not working. Just wait. Again, it's easy to say, hard to do sometimes. We live in a society of... I need an answer and I need it now. I need to know what to do. No, I can't wait. I already put my post on Facebook. Somebody's got to respond to me, right? That's not the answer. Go ahead, Leonard. They did. Yes. Patience. And it's, it's active waiting. You know, it's not like you're sitting here doing nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely active. Staying in prayer, staying in worship, even when you don't have your answer. But I, I literally wrote that. I did a lot of journaling back in the days. Mm -hmm. And I did write. I wrote that out. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 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 All right. So verse four says, behold, his soul. So now God is still answering Habakkuk. He said, behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. So he's talking about the Babylonians, the people who are prideful. Their soul is not upright. But the just, in contrast, shall live by faith. So here you have this contrast. The Babylonians, their soul was lifted up. And they have this problem with pride. And pride always leads to sin because it's all about me. Despite having everything, they're going to have a very poor outcome. So the nation that Habakkuk is really worried about destroying Israel, God says, don't you worry. They're going to get theirs, right? Um, because of mainly of their pride. But the contrast is the one who lives by faith. Because pride is the contradiction to faith. 
You can't have faith when you're prideful. Pride gives you this false feeling that, no, I can do it. I can attain salvation. I can earn my righteousness. I can, I can, I can. All I got to do is do what I think is right. What's faith say? Thing more than the past four years, but yeah, definitely personified, right? Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. yes, sir, absolutely. Mm -hmm. No, and I think that's true for everything. I think it's true for everything whenever it comes to even when we're given personal blessings in our lives. We forget that this is all a gift of God. You didn't earn. You came into this world with nothing. Even the fact that you can have a nice job. That's in one sense, oh, it's because we live in America, land of opportunity. What gave America the ability to be the land of opportunity? What gave any of us the chance to have what we have, no matter what we have? It's all because of the grace of God, the mercy of God. So pride, as I said, is the contradiction to faith. So you cannot earn favor with God. Nothing you do is praiseworthy without faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. It's knowing that you can never measure up and you must trust in the love and mercy of God. So the leader of the Babylonians, he's going to be characterized by pride, as we read a verse from earlier in Daniel chapter four, right? He's all about himself. So God's answer starts out with the judgment of God upon Israel and the fact that even those who is, he is using to judge Israel will be judged for their own wickedness. So there's a much greater purpose to everything God's doing. And we'll read about that in verse 14 here of chapter two when we get there. Now, it is interesting, this passage, just a little background. As I was studying this, I came across this story. There was a young theologian. He was born in 1483. He was on his way to Rome um, to kind of do a, a track so he can um, be more spiritually enlightened is what his goal was. And he was crossing the Alps. And as he crossed the Alps on foot, he nearly froze to death, nearly died. So he goes to this monastery, and he's being nursed back to health over several weeks and months. And while he's there, he's thinking about this idea of sin. And no matter how pious he's trying to be, he's like, how can I get rid of the sin that's in my life? And it really troubled him. So one of the monks at the monastery said, you know, you should read the book of Habakkuk. So, of course, he comes across and he reads the verse about the just shall live by faith. So he then returns home and he spends weeks and months and even years trying to understand this concept of justification by faith. And finally, he comes to the conclusion that that is the path to salvation. And then he writes all these things down into 95 theses and he nails them to the monastery church wall, to the castle church wall. And of course, Martin Luther, right? And he's the one that essentially led to the Reformation and things like that. But it really it shakes up the whole medieval church because this concept of justification, you can't earn it on a big scheme was, was earth shattering. You can't earn it. That's what Jesus told us long ago. But it was a very hard concept for people to grasp. Salvation is a gift of God. That's it. Faith means seeing things the way that God says it is. Not through the way I see it. It's not about what I see. It's about how God tells me that it is. It's seeing the world through the lens of the Bible. That is called the biblical worldview. It's not just creationism. It's not just, you know, uh, theistic evolution or whatever. No, it's actually just believing what God has told us. See the world through God's words, the living word, the Bible. And so the just will live by faith. So now going back to the Chaldeans, these Babylonians, God is going to go through these woes, right? These pities over the judgment that's going to come on them. So he starts out with their prideful ambition. 
in chapter 2, verse 5 of Habakkuk, it says, Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell and is, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathered unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Shall not all these take up a parable against him, and a taunting proverb against him, and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his? How long? And to him that ladeth himself with thick clay? Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee, and awake that shall vex thee, and thou shalt be bo uh, for booty for them unto them? Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood and for the violence of the land and of the city and of all that dwell therein. So the first proclamation of woe upon the Chaldeans is that they will never be satisfied. They always want more and they're going to be judged for this. No matter how much power they had, they wanted more. When they have wine, they want more wine. When they conquer new lands, they want to conquer even more lands. They will be keeping, they keep focusing on themselves. They become entrenched in their own covetousness and desire. So it talks about up there where they're going to heap clay upon themselves. It says, and ladeth himself with thick clay. If I keep wanting more and more clay, what happens as I pile the clay up around me? What am I doing? I'm entombing myself, right? I am absolutely burying myself. And that's essentially what they're doing. All their riches and their fact of chasing more money, it's becoming their trap. It's entrapping them. They would suddenly be spoiled. And that's exactly what happens when their old ally, the Medes, find a new ally in the Persians. And ultimately, they get overthrown, as we read about in the book of Daniel, right, with Belshazzar. Um, so, of course, that's how do they do that. They stop the river. You guys remember that story where they go under the walls of Babylon. So how do you find the Babylonians? What situation are they in on the last day of their empire? They're drunk. They're having sexual immorality until, as you might say, they saw the writing on the wall, right? They saw that hand writing the judgment on the wall. So judgment had come. So the big message that God's giving Habakkuk so far is no matter how strong and powerful and seemingly uh, impervious the wicked are, they will fall. They will fail. They do not win in the end. No one is strong forever except for Jesus Christ. He is the only one who is eternally all-powerful. No one else is all-powerful at all, but Jesus' power never wanes. I'm sure glad we don't live in a country with a pride problem, right? I mean, thank goodness. I know, right? I'm glad we don't talk about how we should have the best of everything. And we always need to, you know, no matter how much we have, we deserve more, right? I mean, nobody needs that new iPhone and all that stuff. We're all good. We don't have a pride problem. Thank goodness for that. Okay, let's move on to verse nine. It says, now this one's about their covetousness, okay? So woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and has sinned against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. So the Chaldeans, they're very impressed with themselves. They want to lift themselves up and make a name for themselves in history. They built beautiful things. One of the ancient wonders, which they're still looking for good evidence of, but one of the ancient wonders recorded in many history books are the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Some of the most beautiful gardens ever imagined were supposedly within the city of Babylon. But ultimately, what happened to it? They desired to have great cities, great everything. Well, guess what? It's all gone. It was all destroyed. They devoted, they devoted themselves to the things of this earth. And guess what? They lost it all. That's a lesson to all of us, right? Don't fall into their trap. Be wise. Who cares how nice your house is, how nice your car is, what you've got? It does not matter. Use what you've got to the glory of God. Use what you've got to the glory of God. Temporal pleasures do nothing for eternal rewards. I, again, I'm very glad we don't live in a covetous country, right? We don't live in a country where everyone needs the coolest car or the nicest house. 
Nobody's looking for that, right? We don't need the bigger and better thing. So again, as we know that that's the case, but we hope that as Christians, we don't follow that pattern, right? We don't need to chase things down. Are you devoting yourself in your day? How much is devoted to eternal things and how much is devoted to temporal things, temporary? Temporal and temporary, same root word, right? How much is devoted to temporary things? We need to look at the focus on how we can bring people to Christ, how we can do his will, because then you're storing your treasures in heaven, not here on earth where they're just destroyed. As they say, you can't take it with you. So then the next woe to the Chaldeans. Again, Habakkuk, he's, he's liking now what he's hearing. He's hearing that these people are going to be judged. God's not through with the Babylonians. So the next one is woe to them for their ruthlessness and their cruelty. This is verse 12. It says, woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establisheth a city by iniquity. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire and the people shall weary themselves for vanity. For the earth, this is the good news, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God or the glory of the Lord as the waters covered the sea. So these Babylonians, they have no trouble with murdering and violence for personal gain. They think that's perfectly reasonable and the right way to live. And even as they burn down a town and it seems hopeless to Habakkuk as he watches Jerusalem burn, God will continue to work. God is still has a purpose, even in the fire. He has something that he is doing. They base their cities, the Babylonians base their cities on sin, and they actually want to do more sin. Well, I'm real glad that our country doesn't have, you know, sin in our cities. They haven't become centers of, of inventing new ways to sin. I'm glad we don't have cities that are full of violence and wickedness. I'm glad that we don't have, you know, some political stance that says, oh, you know what, we can excuse these sins and these acts of wickedness, or we can just ignore them. It would be a real bad situation, wouldn't it be, if we just had cities full of murder and violence, and that's just part of the everyday news scene? Wouldn't that be a problem? Or how about when we invent new ways to sin and make new sinful television shows and radio shows and movies and songs? Wouldn't it be a shame if we lived in such a society? But again, do you see the mirrors that we have today? To begin, the, the interesting thing here for the Christian, despite all the destruction and the wickedness and all this horribleness that's happening, God reveals a very important point to have. Despite everyone's plan to fill this world as much as it can hold with evil and wickedness, he says, my work will succeed. He doesn't say, I might fill the world with the knowledge of God. No, no. He will fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. So how can that be? How can these wicked people who are so successful, how can they exist and the knowledge of the word of the Lord come around? How is that? Well, again, it was, we see that the answer comes from a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of a big statue representing every world empire from him to today. But then there is a little rock that's cut without hands that comes from heaven that shatters the empires of this world to pieces. And then it grows and fills the entire earth. There is passage after passage after passage throughout the minor prophets and through the entire Bible that speak of a literal, physical kingdom of heaven here on earth with Jesus reigning from the throne. It's all over the Bible. Yet most people deny its existence. They say, no, it can never physically happen. That's been the prophecy ever since Nebuchadnezzar's time and even before. This is what the Bible has always talked about. The Psalms talk about when Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron. But by the time we get to the book of Revelation, when the kingdom of God in our hearts is already existing, and he says, oh, yeah, you're going to rule with Jesus when he rules with the king with a rod of iron. But wait a minute. I thought it was already here. According to the Bible, according to the new, the last book of the New Testament, it's still yet future. Is he going to rule? all the believers in heaven with a rod of iron? Is he there to punish us? No, no, he's going to rule the kingdoms of this earth with a rod of iron. The Bible's quite clear on that. And here's just yet another passage that God is going to reign on earth as Jesus Christ during the millennial reign. Yes, ma'am. It's, uh, it's Sunday school. 
daughter on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And about you know, when he started doubting, and I can doubt you're okay, and a whole thing question. But you know, why don't we think about how do you know the Bible is true? Well, what do you look at history? You know, and God said he talked about the different empires that rose up and then fell. History, you don't have to read the Bible to know that that's true. Mm -hmm. You have to read recorded in history. So in secular you know, history. Yeah, you, you see this. The right. And what's interesting also, you know, when we specifically talking about the book of Daniel, there are all kinds of critics of the book of Daniel and their criticisms are there's no way that this book was written when they claim that it was written because it details the coming kingdoms with such accuracy. It has to be a fraud. So they, they just said there's no way it's true. But then they found the Septuagint and based on when it was translated, it shows that it preceded most of these kingdoms. But they still refuse to believe it, even though they know it's way too accurate for it to be coincidence, like extraordinarily accurate. But the thing is, people just want an excuse, and they'll take any excuse to reject the word of God. It doesn't have to be logical. It just has to be an excuse. So the next woe to the Chaldeans for the debauchery. It says in verse 15, it says, Woe unto him that gives his neighbor drink and puttest the bottle to him and makes him drunken also that they may look that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also. Let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory for the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee and the spoil of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood and for the violence of the land and of the city and of all that dwell therein. So this is an interesting passage. And again, be careful when people want to take things out of context. A lot of people will take this passage and say, aha, see, you can't ever drink alcohol. Alcohol is forbidden. Woe unto him that gives his neighbor drink. But again, read what it says. It says, for the purpose of to that you can look on their nakedness. They're trying to intoxicate people, to get them hooked on drugs, if you will, or alcohol in order to take advantage of them, in order to take from them the things that they shouldn't they otherwise wouldn't give these people they're focused completely on the pleasure of the moment with no regards for the consequences or the judgment of god the righteousness of god they don't care right they will ultimately be ashamed of themselves how do most diseases spread by the way it spreads by immorality usually attached with drugs and alcohol and other things right the and again the god talks about the cup of his fury being poured out on the whole earth He's furious with those that refuse to turn to him and follow the laws that he gave us that are good for us. Being pure, being moral. By the way, that's one, that's one of the four Old Testament laws that applies to the entire church based on Acts 15, right? Wouldn't it be a disaster if the world we lived in today was all about self-pleasure, right? Wouldn't that be a horrible thing? Wouldn't it be terrible? Imagine if our colleges would take our children and expose them to drugs, alcohol, sex is one of the main themes. Or even worse, what if it came to our high schools or maybe our middle schools? Wouldn't it be a disaster? Um, what if we taught our kids from a very young age that they evolved from nothing, they're a cosmic accident, and when they die, it won't matter? Wouldn't that be a catastrophe if we were to take that as our public stance? I mean, I would really be upset if we lived in such a time because that meant judgment was coming soon. Obviously, I'm being facetious. We live in exactly such a time, and judgment is coming soon. So then we get to the next woe. This is now for their idolatry. Verse 17 about Lebanon. It says, for the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee and the spoil of beasts. Yeah. So Lebanon it is famous for the worship of Baal, right? Is and that still in Lebanon? Today? Yeah, well, that's where I'm from, yes. But Lebanon back then was simply a mountain and had a few different city states around it. There was a Canaanite tribe that lived there, which became what we currently consider Lebanon. But Lebanon, as we know it today, was uh, essentially its borders were drawn in the early 1900s. So particularly after the Ottoman Empire fell, they redivided Lebanon, Syria, all those different things after World War II. Um, so yeah, I mean, but the point being the violence of those places and also the cruelty that the Babylonians did to the animals of the people and the blood of the people that they spilled, right? All of this is going to turn back onto the Babylonians when they're overthrown. And we know that's at the hands of Cyrus the Great, as we call him, right? And King Darius. 
So, so now we get to the verse 18 through 20, which talks about their idolatry. It says, what profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven? It? The molten image and a teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, awake to the dumb stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, but there is no breath at all in the midst of it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. So notice the contradiction between the false idols and the true living God. All the false idols, you tell them what to say. You tell them what you want from them. He's like, but when you come before God, you keep your mouth shut, right? So the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, they were spiritually bankrupt. They had nothing. They had no faith in the true and living God. They had no interest. Their gods were empty, and ultimately they would become empty because you become like the gods you worship, right? There was no profit and no purpose in worshiping these false idols. They would go about their day filling them with meaningless words, meaningless things. And what would they do? They'd wake up on their beds feeling empty. They'd wake up in the middle of the night feeling hollow and depressed and miserable. Why? Because their gods had nothing. I would pity a country that found itself filling itself with useless television shows about sin or meaningless contests and spending hours upon hours watching grown men fight over a ball, right? If that's your only joy in life, I enjoy a football game. I enjoy television. I'm not saying you can't enjoy those things, but if that's where your purpose and your value comes from, I pity you because you probably wake up at, in the morning, in the middle of the night, wondering, what's my point? What am I doing here? What is the purpose to all this, right? Anxiety and depression, they're overrunning our society. And the ultimate question is why? And in my humble opinion, it's because we have a greater purpose to seek and to serve a loving God, a loving Savior. We have a value and a purpose that God called us for. And when we don't feel it, guess what? You're not going to feel fulfilled. You're not going to be happy and comfortable. It doesn't mean everything's good when you do that, but you still have value. There are people living with nothing that feel like they have everything. So notice how God concludes the matter. He sends out a reminder that even though we've forgotten him, he's still, he hasn't forgotten us. He's still in his temple waiting, waiting for true worship, right? And we know that Jesus ultimately does come out of his temple. But unfortunately, at the time when he comes out, he's carrying a long scythe, right? He's coming to reap the world, and that's in the book of Revelation. So ultimately, what is the whole idea in this chapter? The situation of Babylon, this evil, wicked nation, sadly reflects a lot of the world today. And it reflects where America's heading today, right? We feel overwhelmed. Does anyone here not ever feel overwhelmed by the sin in the world? by the wickedness that's going on all around us. Our day-to-day, -day, we see this everywhere. But throughout all of that, God sends this reminder that he is in control. And when he comes, there'll be no arguing. There'll be no, well, I think you should know. You will be silent before him, right? He knows all about the Babylonians, even though Habakkuk was worried about it. He's like, I know about their wickedness. I know the way they act. I know the way they're going to treat you. I know all of this. You don't need to tell me how wicked they are. But I need to use them, or I will choose to use them, I should say, to judge you, to put you guys back in the right road. So we need to be put back sometimes in the right relationship. We're not always doing God's will. And sometimes we let ourselves go astray. So whenever we look at the wickedness in the world governments and in the media and in the culture, that should draw Christians back to the right path. That should draw us back to do the will of God, to share the gospel, to meet together, to serve God together and individually. But do you see that? I mean, I see the world falling apart. Where is the, what's the word I'm looking for whenever we have the revivals? Where's the revival of biblical Christianity? Where is it happening? I hope it's happening, but I, I don't see it very much. Where is it happening in the world? As we see all this stuff going horrible, shouldn't that draw us back? but we don't necessarily get drawn back, right? We just continue down our own little path along with the rest of the world. And then we wonder, God, why is this happening? Why is this happening? So God called for the Jews to return by bringing the judgment through Babylon. And I believe he's calling for us to return 
to get back on the path of Christ, not our own path. So the climax of all of these events at that time was that ultimately a savior would come. And guess what? A savior did come for the first coming. He came to the Jews when they were oppressed, not by the Babylonians, not necessarily by the Persians, but ultimately by the Romans. The savior came and he could have set up his throne if they would have accepted him. But they said no. So guess what? Things have followed the same pattern. And here we are again. And guess what? The Savior is coming. Be ready for him. God knows exactly what's going on in the world. Don't be stressed about all that's going on. He's not ignoring it. But he is just taking us one step closer to the reign of Christ. And that brings us to the end of chapter 2.